Um, welcome to everybody for joining us. This is our second live Story of Place webinar, and we are really thrilled to be doing this webinar series to tell the conservation stories of some of the really special places on the Blue Hill Peninsula. Also peppered into this webinar series are a few uh, stories of places that are not under conservation uh, by necessarily by Blue Hill Heritage Trust, but are places of great importance and significance to our community. And uh, so far, we have heard from folks uh, from Blue Hill Heritage Trust's present and past on Blue Hill Mountain. And that recording is available on our website. We also had a really wonderful presentation with our friend, the late Bob Slavin, on the granite quarries in East Blue Hill, the, the MK Chase granite quarries. And that recording is available on our website as well. This whole webinar series is dedicated to the memory of our friend Bob, who had a really infectious love for not just the peninsula, but for knowing the history and the story of the peninsula. And we were grateful to him for instilling that um, importance and love of sort of the whole picture of this place with us. Um, today, we are going to be discussing three properties actually, but it's sort of a story in and of itself. We're gonna be talking about the Carter Nature Preserve and the Firth Talalay Sanctuaries, which are all located off of the crossroad in Surrey, Maine. And I grew up less than a mile from these properties and knew nothing of them. I never spent any time there. They were not a significant part of my childhood. And as somebody who is constantly reminding her children how lucky they are to live here and have these places, I'm a little bit embarrassed that I never had spent any time at these places as a kid myself. But it does look like, as I've been researching this story, that a lot of this conservation story happens when I became a teenager and was pretty surly and probably didn't care very much about being out in the natural world. So uh, I'll excuse myself, but I am no longer a surly teenager. And these are among my favorite Blue Hill Heritage Trust properties. I absolutely love them. I take my own family, not just my kids, but my extended family there all the time. They're among my top recommended trails because they really are so unique. And together, these three properties form a really significant network of trails. And we really have a lot of people to thank for the fact that these properties are protected forever, left open to the public, and here for the human and the natural communities that call that part of the Morgan Bay watershed home. Um, we're really going to be focusing on the conservation story. There's so much that we could talk about, about the ecology, about the geology of these places, but we're really going to focus mostly on the conservation story, the people who have helped make these conservation lands possible and uh, and hear what their their memories are. We also have some folks who are really important to this story who are no longer with us or are not on the screen and some of them you'll see photos of on the slideshow as the slideshow goes through and I'm sure many names will be mentioned. Um, I want to also acknowledge we have some family members of the Firth and Talalay family on with us today and we're really glad that you're here. If you have any special memories or sentiments that you would like for me to share on behalf of your family, please feel free to put them in chat directly to me or if you'd like to speak, I'm happy to unmute you at some point as well. This uh, talk will probably go for a little over an hour. Folks can feel free to drop on and off as they need to. We will be recording it in its entirety. So, Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started because we've got a lot of people here and a lot of questions and a lot of things to share. And I'm going to start off with Hugh and Susan Curran, who are going to give us a uh, sort of their memory of the history of how this all got started. Go ahead, guys. Okay, so um, while you were talking, I just had <laughs> more recollections. So I'll just say one of them off the uh, bat before I read what my prepared statement. Uh, it was about the Carter sisters who 
um, had a lot to do with donating the land. It wasn't really donated, but uh, it was a bargain sale. They reduced the price uh, considerably and uh, because they wanted to have it protected. So it was, uh, but they told me at one point about an uncle. I totally forgot the story because they wrote to me and then they talked with me on the phone. Uh, an uncle in the early 1900s who lived on a boat off the Carter Nature Preserve. <laughs> Would you believe it? Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, well, the, they couldn't have done that through the winter. And he says, oh, yes, they did um, because it froze up. But then their boat broke so badly, they decided not to do ever do it again. So uh, anyhow, it was pretty amazing to hear that story of somebody living on, on a boat right off the nature preserve. But to get into the uh, nitty gritty, the, uh, we started, uh, I heard about it from John Firth, uh, who came over to visit. Of course, he's a close neighbor. He was. And... Uh, he told me about this uh, piece of property that the Carter sisters owned and their nephew, uh, who was a lawyer up in Orrington, decided to put it on the market, uh, but wanted to sell it to, you know, for like four, 10, seven or eight or 10 homes. And we said, no, no, we can't do that. So he said, well, um, maybe they can work something out because it'd be very hard to get in there with a the road and so on. So. Uh, we began approaching them, and it was decided on um, uh, on a seventy on a fifty thousand dollar bargain sale. And if we could raise that money, and then I went to Blue Hill Heritage Trust, and I talked to them. And at that time, it was um, Ellen Warner was the president, and she um, she was very say <laughs> she was very good and wise in how she told me how to go about trying to raise this. What to me at the time was a fantastic sum of money. And uh, I and she says, you know, sometimes you have to go door to door. So I actually did decide to do that in 1994 and spent about a year uh, going uh, every weekend, every time I had any time free, walking to see all the neighbors. It's actually good for me because I got to know a lot of neighbors on Newbury Neck and along the East Blue Hill Road and talked to everybody I could. Everybody was uh, very kind and, and good and good hearted. And uh, often I would get promises of um, doning, don donors. Eventually, I think we had about 100 people agreed to donate, including people on our road here and up through Morgan Bay Road. But um, the Carter sisters, anyhow, the, the, it was this 23 acre site and it bordered on John Firth's property. It was actually shared by John and Jean at the time. And Jacob uh, and his mother, uh, uh, mother, parents both bought it back in 1947, the property ju juxtaposed with the Carter Nature Preserve, what is now the Carter Nature Preserve. So uh, I went to and exchanged letters with a lawyer in Orrington. Uh, I talked, as I said, to the elderly Carter sisters who owned the property. And then I worked with another Firth, the Firths are in this story a lot, Don Firth, who was not, uh, I think, a distant relation possibly, but we didn't know, who lived on Newbury Neck and was part of the Blue Hill Heritage Trust. And he did a lot to immediately, because he had a background in finances in New York, he, he began uh, working on, you know, helping on the taxes and all the other issues. And then we got the, uh, uh, John and Jean both put in uh, uh, a certain, a substantial amount to get the whole thing going, the fundraising going, uh, probably maybe even 20% of the total. Uh, and then I went, as I said, door to door, uh, and then when I had gone to see Ellen and she had talked with the board, they said, well, we, we can't take it from you until you raise an additional 20. I think it could have been 30,000, but I think it was 20 uh, as an endowment to for taxes and all the other uh, needs over the years uh, and uh, insurance and so on. So at that time, uh, I, after talking to people, I had the help of, you know, local people, Mark Baldwin drew a beautiful map that I could use as I walked door to door showing the property. Uh, the Surrey people uh, all came forward, almost everybody came forward. And the last person I went to see by appointment was, uh, I called him ahead, was Mr. Backer uh, up on uh, what we call the ups and downs. And I went in and it was a very vivid story to me because when I went in to talk to him, uh, very kind, gave me a little whatever it was, something to drink, Pepsi or something. And uh, we sat out on the patio and he said, um, he says, well, what's this all about? And I said, well, I pointed out to him right below us. I said, from your patio, you'll see this 
um, 23 acres. And I said, Dude, would you like would you like to save that? Because if we don't save it, there could be up to 10 or 12 houses on that. And he said, oh, I don't want to look down on houses. He says, I, I want it to be as good the way it is now. So I said, well, how much do you need? I said, well, I've been raising money for a year or it's nine months at the time. We just need another $2,000. So he said, uh, he went away for a few minutes and came back and said, well, on your way out on the mantle, there's a check. And it was folded. And when I went out, I didn't even open it came almost all the way home and I excitedly opened it, thinking it would be like $500, maybe a big, big sum at the time. And there it was, $2,000, all that was necessary to make this $70,000. I think I was like $50 short and I went to the Blue Hill Heritage Trust meeting and with that amount and I said, Ellen, it's all, we have the endowment, we have the money. Uh, and I said, but we're still $50 short. <laughs> and she went around sort of hat in hand as it kind of jokingly, and raised the last $50 just from people in the Blue Hill Heritage Trust uh, <laughs> meeting who were there. So it was very interesting to see that. Um, so I wanted to point out that how, how much it, uh, people like Walter Nowick stepped forward and many other, many neighbors, and he did three concerts, I think, which garnered, I think, about $500 each. So everybody seemed to step forward all ar around on both sides, Newbury Neck, Morgan Bay Road. So I wanted to end up on saying, um, and I do have, Letters on file from somewhere in my files of, from the uh, Carter sisters. They were a lovely couple, very elderly at the time, 1994, 95. And uh, they were very, expre expressed a lot of thanks that the land that their father and uncle so prized so much would henceforward be given protection, be accessible for the public use. So again, you see this kind of neighborliness, community-minded spirit and so on. There were a few naysayers, I should say, that were sort of, sort of thought we were all socialists <laughs> and turning private land into public land. And then gradually over the last, over a few years, they became totally supportive, but initially they were opposed and then they became, you know, oh, and then they claimed all the credit, but they were initially <laughs> very much against it. Uh, but then the change was pretty uh, dramatic. Then the first wildlife sanctuary is another story owned by another pair, uh, couple of Carters, Ruth and Cecil, on the ups and downs area. People are familiar with that. And I, was, I knew she was interested in selling, so I contacted her by phone. And over the course of the next year, we exchanged a number of letters. Uh, and I then also phone calls. I was acting in the role of a facilitator and saw the potentiality of connecting the Carter Nature Preserve with uh, Ruth and Cecil's uh, land. And it included an old town road, now part of the trail that led to the cross road. Uh, Ruth was unwilling to sell her 27 acres unless we could offer 35,000. But when I approached the real estate estimator, Harry Jones, he valued it only at 23,000. Another uh, person I approached also valued it at around 23. Uh, so we were not because of the, the market value and her Ruth's demands or expectations did not match. Uh, we were not really allowed to purchase at that price. I talked to the Blue Hill Heritage Trust, I think it was Jim Dow at the time, and he said, um, we have to work something else out. So I talked to Gene Firth, who was in, back, had gone back to North Carolina, and I told him the situation, and I went back and forth, and probably another half dozen calls and letters went on there, and he agreed to be the in-between person to offer, make up the difference so it was reduced to 30,000 because they cut it over. Ruth and Cecil had it cut over. So they gained a few thousand there and they were willing to reduce it to 30. So Gene decided, he said, well, I'll make up the difference between 23 and the 30. I think, uh, I can't swear to the exact amount, but I think that was the situation as I recall it. Uh, Jim Dow and Don Firth were able to work out the financial details. Uh, and then uh, Gene also, that donation, and uh, other donations uh, also came forward. And then the Blue Hill Heritage Trust managed to come up with uh, the differences there as well. So uh, uh, we had a very active group which Susan will talk about, the Friends of Morgan Bay, who then took uh, on the role of the uh, stewards. Um, the rights of way were a whole other issue and that took many months to work that out. And John and Jean had to go through their property uh, they had by this time divided up the property. 
and they both agreed to allow uh, rights of way. And that was kind of a can of worms. It really took a lot of working out. We had to measure everything and measure the widths and who would be agree what they'd be agreeable and put it into a legal form. So we had all that going on for, I'd say that took many months. And uh, I think, uh, as I said, the, the whole thing was involved such a, an amount of, uh, it gave me a lot of um, pers pers personally a sense of satisfaction to feel that the community could come forward in this way. It was a huge uh, affair for me because I devoted the whole year, over a whole year of my life to it, a good part of my life doing it. And I actually felt a great deal of sense of reward in it. In the end, I, said, I gained a lot from doing the process and learning all about it. So I think uh, that's, I could say a lot more about the people involved. I would say that um, uh, everyone contributed to whatever they could afford to do others. Some people could only give a small amount because of their income, but we had small amounts up to a hundred donors, some as little as $50, some a hundred, some a thousand and some 2000 and so on. So we had uh, everyone coming forward uh, to make up that uh, $70,000. So thank you for listening to this sort of beginnings of the Carter Nature Preserve. Yeah, and before Susan jumps in, I just, I want to let folks know, so, you know, Carter Nature Preserve was the start of sort of these three really important properties being protected, and as you'll see later in the slideshow, and as, as we'll remark on uh, further down, you'll see that then after Carter Nature Preserve came the Firth property across the road, and then a few years after that came the Talalay property after that, thanks to Paul and Pamela Talalay. So it's just, you know, Carter Nature Preserve got it started and the ball kept rolling from there, and that's what makes this such a cool story. So go ahead, Susan, I'm done. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm gonna talk a little about Friends of Morgan Bay. Um, our group that it actually grew out of an earlier organization, the Surrey Wetlands Association that Susan Shetterly started in the 1980s. Uh, that group was not set up to do fundraising. So when the possibility of buying the land that became the Carter Nature Preserve occurred, Friends of Morgan Bay was formed in 1994 by several of us who live near Morgan Bay and were interested in preserving and protecting land in the Morgan Bay watershed. We were also interested in educating ourselves and others on ecological issues that had to do with the watershed, the bay, and its wildlife. As such, we worked in partnership with the Blue Hill Heritage Trust. Uh, as Hugh has mentioned, we did a lot of fundraising for the trust in the early days, and for ourselves as well, as once the Carter Nature Preserve was a reality, Friends of Morgan Bay designed and put in the trails on that preserve, and we paid at that time, we paid for any materials that were involved. Uh, we also did the trail work, which Norman will talk about for the Firth and Talalay sanctuaries. Uh, other work we did, we designed and printed up pamphlets for the Carter Nature Preserve um, that went in a box at the big kiosk that Norman made for the uh, preserve, which is uh, set at the beginning, I'm reading this, <laughs> at the beginning of the access trail to the preserve. The kiosk uh, featured a beautiful map drawn up by Norman and Paula's daughter, Kate. Um, and I, that, that was a very, uh, our, our initial mm -hmm. ability to, I mean, our, our initial trial at a pamphlet, which um, looked sort of like that. That's just a, um, Several years ago, we then designed and printed a much better pamphlet about the three preserves that we steward. Uh, but when we did that, and that is, looks a lot better. This was the, this had de dealt with the Carter Nature Preserve, the Talalay, uh, and uh, the Firth Wildlife Sanctuary and sort of history about it. Um, but that was before the Brennick Myers gave the trust the land for the current parking lot on the crossroad and the right of way that created the loop trail that now connects to the Carter Nature Preserve. And Paula recently redid a newer pamphlet on the Carter Nature Preserve that includes uh, the loop trail. Um, and here's, this is the, uh, the loop trail. 
Um, in recent years, uh, the trust has taken over the more strenuous parts of trail maintenance, but we continue to have regular trail cleanup days as Friends of Morgan Bay. And uh, we keep the trust informed if trees have fallen on the paths or other upkeep needs to be done. I just wanna uh, end by saying that years ago, I remember the Surrey Wetlands Association writing up a sort of wish list of the land we wanted to see protected around the Morgan Bay and its watershed. At the time, it seemed uh, like a sort of pie in the sky dream of what we wish could happen, but, and it seemed totally unattainable. It was just what we sort of dreamed about doing. Mm -hmm. But all these years later, I think of all that land that we wished could be protected that is protected now, and it's incredibly gratifying to think of that. So anybody who's interested in doing this work, dream big and, uh, and just believe in the possibilities. And I'm, there are lots of people I ha we haven't mentioned who took part in all of the work that we have done over the years. I, and I hope they know that we are thankful to all of them. I, I should send Andy Candid. Yeah, Andy and Nancy, Nancy Candid. A lot of work uh, involved, especially Andy was working physically with us right up till um, he had some debilitating uh, health problems. That's great. Thank you both for starting that off. And I will share that I have Kate's original artwork that yeah. I salvaged one day. Yeah. And I, so I have her original map here that I intend to scan and save um, so everybody can have it. And I definitely need to send a copy of it to Kate too. So I love it. It's mm -hmm. such lovely artwork to have. So Margaret, I'd like to turn it over to you. You know, you live right there at the, at the bottom of the hill in the crossroads. You can see from that first initial trailhead, the people coming and going. What is, how, you know, how do you feel like this effort really changed your neighborhood and the way you thought of that place? Well, okay, it's going to be a little different from that amazing recounting of the history. I learned so much from both Hugh, Hugh and Susan that I didn't even know and wasn't aware of. So this is wonderful. Okay, so this is gonna be a little different. Okay, so the water and the fields and the woods are the same as they were 50 years ago when we moved here. Down the gravel road across the bridge stood the first lone farmhouse as it stands now. It faces the beautiful rolling field that ends at the bay. Across the road from our house, other fields sweep down to meet the bay at the bridge. They remain unchanged. There were no other houses the length of this road that cuts through the deep woods. Now there are 10 plus. Then our boys would gleefully spend days in the woods with their dog Seabor to come home with tall tales of animal life they encountered, like the tale of a magical battle between an eagle and an osprey over fish, which ended with a fish falling at Charlie's feet, where he was cutting the first field. He brought it home for dinner. <laughs> the boys made a film on the lore of Morgan Bay called Captain Morgan's Ghost. Shore exploring, swimming at the bridge, blueberrying, picnicking, Putting the boat in the water, fishing were an extension of our home, a sense of ownership. There were eels in the water. Are they still there? Susan, you would know. And herons in the grasses of the wetlands, as they are now. Ducks, a beaver, a mink. Trucks or or useful old cars would park at the bridge so clamors could slug through the mud with their baskets and rakes and bend over for hours harvesting the crop. In hunting season, we would get startled by
by the sharp crack of gunshots and wonder in what kind of wilderness we had decided to settle. We were reminded then that land and water provided income. Papers, papers. Now car, now cars with out of state license plates crowd that parking space. An occasional clamor still works the flats. Shots still ring out. Then summer officially began with the boys when John and Mary first came from Pennsylvania with their children to bring a taste of the outside world and generously shared their own excursions with them. Their children and grandchildren still come. School was initially the Noick Corner School across from Walter Noick's farm and was run by Mr. Noick's students. Outdoor learning to the extreme. The boys loved it. And then it was off to the Surrey School, walking up the hill to catch the bus, making friends with local children, television and Nintendo. The school bus now comes down the paved road to pick up children. The Currens, Mozikis, Shetleys built their homes. The shared love and appreciation of where we all had grounded generated the wish and dedication to preserve and share our fortune for future generations. The road is paved, the bridge was replaced. There are now carefully maintained trails through the woods that the ever increasing visitors enjoy, especially in the summers. <clears throat> Walking sticks are propped up by the kiosk in case of need. To save the ground nesting birds, dogs are leashed in the woods. Water, fields, and woods remain the same. They are now everyone's garden. So, information, I'm not sure there was a lot of, but feeling there is. <laughs> That's exactly what we're looking for. Thank you so much. Yeah. That was wonderful. Thank you. And I, you know, I commented at the beginning that I didn't know this place, even though it was in my neighborhood, my stomping grounds. But so much of what you said <laughs> brought back a lot of vivid memories of my time with your own children as I was a child there. So that was really that was little May baskets, Chrissy. You remember the main baskets? I do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Susan Guilford, I'm gonna throw it over to you. Um, one of the you know final thoughts that Margaret had was sort of talking about the the groomed trails and things that are there on these properties, and you are you are one of the trail stewards. Can you talk a little bit about your relationship with these places and and give a little insight on what it's like to be a trail steward for Blue Hill Heritage Trust? Uh, yes, thank you, Margaret. That was lovely. <laughs> Susan and Hugh, I learned so much from what you had to say. Thank you for pulling that together. Um, as Margaret or Susan Curran said, we actually steward the trails as a community effort. So Friends of Morgan Bay are the stewards or is the stewards of um, the trails. And we go out uh, one of us at a time or sometimes two or some of, sometimes three of us together. And we walk the trail uh, looking for anything that needs attention. And if it's something major like chainsawing or say repairing a bog bridge, uh, we refer that back to the trust. One of us checks in with uh, Sandy and lets her know. Um, but it, it is a group effort and we're, we're happy to do it as a group. And uh, it's been that way for quite a long time. Uh, once or twice a year, we have work days just to clear brush back and do the sort of minimal kinds of upkeep that have to happen, but it's definitely a group project. It's a neighborhood watch. That's a great way to think about it. Um, and I have more questions for you, but I'm going to hold them for a little while because you do some really interesting uh, different things on there. 
Um, and so I want to uh, I want to make sure we talk about citizen science. Um, you know, I'm going to. Okay, Tony Talley was just chiming in, so I'm gonna let I'm gonna have Tony speak in just a couple of minutes. Uh, Susan Shetterly, can you can you talk a little bit? You are an author, and you really have you've done a lot of writing about this area of the world for some major magazines, also children's literature. And I'm wondering if you can reflect about your personal and professional connection to this place and how it has sort of informed your writing. Well, actually, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, I've been trying to write about that recently because it's important to me to figure that part out. And the thing about writing is you're not quite sure what you're saying is true until you write it down and read it back to yourself. <laughs> but I have never actually written a book about um, the head of the bay where the Carter Nature Preserve is, a children's book or, or but I did write an essay that was in um, Yankee and it was called The Preserve. And um, so I'm gonna kind of segue to that. But first I wanna say, um, it is such a blessing to live in a neighborhood of people who care for the same things you do and who want to learn as you're learning too. And then who, Hugh went out and did this huge amount of work and we ended up eventually supporting him. And it, it's just been, you know, we're very lucky. We're incredibly lucky. But um, what I want to talk about is what I wrote in the preserve, which is an essay I wrote for, uh, for Yankee, is what happened when this secret, beautiful, wonderful place of ours that we thought belonged to us, even though it didn't by deed, and we thought nobody else knew about it, was about to be sold because either we were going to lose it toward, for to development or we were going to do what he wanted to do and try to save it and open it up to the public. And during that time, right after it was bought and the, our trail was put in, I remember going to uh, the Merzikis one day after I had walked it and Norman was home and I was crying. And I said, I just walked by a woman who had pulled up all the beach heather by the roots. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I wanted him to get mad and he didn't. He, didn't. he said, you know, it, it, we have to teach people. That's our job now. And I thought, oh my God, they're never gonna learn. I mean, there was a guy in the first field who ran his motorcycle right into the place where you go down to the bay and he had set up a, a fire and built, you know, put up a tent and everything. But then what happened is things started to change and they started to change nationally. And that was so exciting because instead of this old story of humans walking through something and they have to move a rock, they have to cut a tree, they have to show they were there in some way the national idea of national places and also small places was walk through and walk through as if you were never there. Because in that way, what happens is it belongs to the birds and the trees and everything else there. Get the feeling for what that's like, because that's pretty splendid. And we have to learn how to step back. And so the, um, the Carter Nature Preserve taught us how to present it to other people. And it was a long haul. You know, some people day after day, they'd come out, they'd put a little cairn up, you know, just to make sure they were here. And then I'd go out and take it down. Um, but <laughs> I know, uh, I, I was mean. But the thing is now people walk through they barely touch anything. And if I'm walking too, they walk by me and they say, 
they don't know who I am from anybody. And they say, isn't this the most beautiful place? Don't you love being out here? Uh -huh. And it just makes me, you know, and then I call up Hugh and thank him again. <laughs> That's so great. It's an educational process. That's all I can say. So I wanted, I want to talk, we've been talking a lot about Carter Nature Preserve, and I want to go across the road for a minute because I want to ask Norman about the trail building efforts. But before I have Norman talk, Tony Talalay, I have unmuted you, Thank and I don't you. know if you can, excellent, there's Tony. So I'd like to invite Tony to share a few words before he has to go. And his father, you'll see a, a, some lovely photos of his folks, um, but please uh, share with us, Tony. Well, I, I, I just wanted for a moment to say that uh, uh, this was incredibly, uh, <laughs> my, my wife is commenting on the chat, are you sure you want to unmute my husband? <laughs> um, and I promise I will. <laughs> um, uh, first, this is incredibly meaningful for our family. Um, the history of this, of, uh, of, of, of bringing this into the Blue Hill Heritage Trust was, was far less contorted than uh, what Hugh and Susan talked about. Um, they were fortunate enough to be able to, to donate the land. Um, and um, it was, it's something very important uh, for all of us to do that. Um, and um, I guess I would say there was, without without giving a long uh, historic history of my dad and my mom, both of whom were refugees. Well, my dad was a refugee from Nazi Germany and Europe and, and eventually uh, ended up having a very uh, notable scientific career uh, um, and was very recognized for some of his molecular science. Um, but everything he did with his science was dedicated to the idea of trying to unlock what, what nature had created. In other words, the scientists didn't, they didn't invent things. They were just trying to understand how nature, how nature worked. And a lot of his work towards the end of his life was dedicated to understanding why vegetables um, are, are, are so good for us. Um, but I also think that, um, he, having been a refugee, um, felt that being in Surrey was a safe place for him. It was a place that, um, you know, he could really, you know, be, be himself and was just, it just gave him incre incredible pleasure. And he often talked about the fact that although he had many, many scientific, uh, much scientific recommendation, uh, recognition and many awards, um, you know, this was uh, establishing the nature sanctuary was really one of his proudest accomplishments. So hearing some about the history here and how it all locks together and from the community um, is just, I think, um, you know, only reinforces the, the, the feeling that we have that this was, this is a special place and a special, a special thing to do. And we're so proud that we can, uh, we've contributed to it and that it can, uh, and my dad was always um, just, fascinated with nature and the plants and the trees and the animals and the birds and so you know this is we're just so happy we could we could be a part of this um and um uh you know i i, I have to say i mean i read susan's piece on the eagles in uh, down east uh in the last couple of months of the eagles playing and it was just we just it just felt right at home for us so um thank you for there's a lot you know there, there's a lot that goes into it and and the support of the of the trust and all the neighbors has been uh, has been enormous and uh we uh um we love you all and we're so glad we could be part of it so um thank you Thanks, Tony. That was great. And Mary, your wife, just chimed in. Um, 
so Tony and Mary's daughter, Miriam, was a, uh, an intern with our outreach coordinator, Lander, this summer. And with, with COVID, we had to cancel a lot of in-person programs. And normally in the, in the summer and fall, we would do a lot of art in nature programs. And Miriam has done a series of incredible how to do nature illustration videos that you can find on our website and on our YouTube page. And so um, Paul Talley's granddaughter still feeling a firm connection mm -hmm. to the land and, and that place. And it's just, it's really, um, it means a lot to us at the Trust when we see that multi-generational contact um, with the land in these places. It's really, really wonderful. So Norman, I, I would love to have you talk a little bit about, you know, we had Carter Nature Preserve, the, then we had that great Firth property that Hugh told us about being protected across the road, and then the Talley property abutting Firth, and then you put in this great trail system. Can you talk a little bit about how you did that and what that was like? Um, I, I really feel like I got the best job in the whole operation. I get to walk around on the land before anybody else does and decide where the trails are going to go. It's a great thrill. I mean, anybody who's ever done that, I'm sure they, they would agree to me. Um, there was no trail on the uh, on the Carnegie Preserve. Uh, uh, other than the shore. The shore was the big attraction. Everybody walked there. Um, we came up here in the early 70s and um, then some years later our kids were born here and uh, that was our backyard. The, the, the Carter Nature Preserve, the Morgan Bay was our backyard. And at one point I was appointed the uh, shellfish warden for the town of Surrey. So my job was to go there like several times a week and, and just look at the bay. Uh, nice thing to do. In those days there would be like three or four Osprey in the air all the time, and when, especially when the tide was coming up and the fish were coming in. And you could just sit there and watch it for hours. Amazing thing to see. Um, and the eels or the um, seals would come in following the fish. It was a really active place. And there weren't a lot of shellfish, um, shellfish diggers then, no, no clamors. Uh, the the uh, clam population had fallen off quite fast and fused before that. Nobody quite understood why. But um, as a result, fewer and fewer people come over coming into Morgan Bay to, to dig, which means I had less and less of a job to do. Um, but I still went down there every day and checked the place out. The, um, like I said, there was, there was no trail uh, other than the, than the uh, shore. And it was kind of exciting to go in there and be like one, probably, for one of the few people who walked that whole forest since it was cut. And it was about 70 years before that. And, and to make a trail through the most interesting places, past the biggest trees, uh, any peculiar, anything you want to find, I'd put a trail by it. And the whole, and the whole line, the whole uh, trail, you could see down to the ocean through the trees, mm -hmm. most the whole way. So they added that aspect to it. Um, it became, I believe, probably the most, not the Woods Trail, but the, the uh, Carter Nature Preserve probably is one of the more popular trails other than the mountain in the whole system because it's the only open water trail that we have and a neat place. Uh, later we got the, um, the uh, Firth property and um, it was a very different, different uh, experience. First of all, I was a little disappointed when I first went in there. I hadn't ever been in there myself except to walk on the, the road. There, the, old, um, the old town road actually runs right up the side of it and about uh, more than half the, the trail that we put in there is in fact the Old Town Road. And that's the only place I'd been in the, in the property. But as I looked more and more around it, uh, I, would, I would be surprised when I would come across these three, four foot in diameter pine uh, stumps. They're very fresh. So this had been very recently cut over and the place would have been somewhat different if we had acquired it before the trees were quite cut, but that's what we got. Um, it's a beautiful woods. It's, it's, there are a lot of big old trees in there. It has, one thing is always a, a big plus is some kind of water feature, a uh, pond or a stream or whatever. And this has the Emerton stream and it's right through the middle of the property. And so it's a fairly healthy stream. There's a lot of water, a lot of, a lot of, uh, life in the water. And, uh, while I, I tempted, I was tempted to just run this, the trail along the stream, there was too much else in there that I didn't want to miss. So I 
went to the stream a couple of times so you could take a look at it and see it's there and then you get back off it and back into the woods that uh, that surrounded the stream and lined the whole property um it, it was really nice and it was again it was a, it was a great big thrill for me because i would be i was the first one to go in there with the eye of making a trail through there um i don't know if anybody ever walked the trail that the property as thoroughly as i did when i was looking uh, exploring to make a trail i walked I crisscrossed the property all of, over and over again and got to know just about every other tree in there. Uh, it was really exciting to do that. Uh, the, um, the other thing about that, about, about that property is that it, it's, it starts at Emerton uh, Heath at the top of the hill, the, the highest point in, in the town of Surrey. It starts as a heath, a wetland, and it gradually collects uh, more and more water till it makes a stream and runs down the hill all the way from the top of the town of Surrey to the ocean. And uh, that's a, I've, it's always fascinated me and every, whenever we kids down there, I always point that out to them that this, this started as a wetland not too far away and then it goes into the ocean. So you can see that whole progression of how a wetland becomes the ocean and it's all one piece. Um, that was the, the first and the uh, and that one I did again the, the um, Carter and Firth I, I pretty much did that but all up by myself all laid out the the trail by myself and uh, but by the time we got to the uh, Talley uh, I was I actually had a, a, another job that I, that took me away from it for a while and um, um, what's his name I can't remember his name. I can't remember anybody's name by the way it's Peter Coleman Peter Coleman. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 took over the project and with what's her name it was the woman who was oh. the she was in charge of um, the trails and stuff then and uh, she came out and did a lot of work too. Was she a forester? Yeah. Sandy. Who? Charlotte? Sandy. No, no, no before no, Sandy. Before her. This was oh, where Charlotte. Her. Charlotte Clues. Charlotte. Oh, no, 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 no. This is before her. No. Um, <laughs> she, she, it was around the time when the, the, the towel lay. Was when we, when we 2000, first early 2000, 2005. When we acquired the Talley Trail. 2006. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, well, they, anyway, they, they came in and, and did most of the trail, laid out most of the trail for me there. Uh, working with Peter was was quite an experience. He's, he's been building trails for the park for I don't know how long. But he's really skilled and has a mar remarkable sense of how to do that. And it's, it's funny how you can see... Like I, I've laid out trails with him on different projects where I would lay out the trail and you know, you can get from point A to point B without falling down any hills or falling in any streams or anything, which I thought was the object. And then he would go tinker with it a bit, bit and it became a whole different adventure. <laughs> he was really, really skilled at how to, how to bring that out of, out of a piece of property just by putting the trail through it. And um, so they did that for a while, and then I kind of went in and, and uh, did some rough edges around it. Uh, and it's still, it's still a very beautiful trail from a, a not terribly fascinating piece of property. I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot of beautiful uh, foliage in there, but it's not, it's not exciting. There's no vistas. There's nothing like that. But they made it a far more interesting place than I ever could. So that's, that's the three properties there, and they're they're... They're again. They're not exciting. This is not Yellowstone. This is not you know uh, <laughs> anything like that. These these are just woods in Maine, and that's what I tell people that you know go there. You'll see these are, are what the woods in Maine are like, and pay attention because it's not like every place else. And um, so I'm glad glad I had the opportunity to do that to, to have the experience of putting trails in places that nobody had ever put trails before. That's and great. And, and thing, what I say, I, thing I tell people all the time about property and, and about you know how much it costs and buying and stuff. I was telling them, that, well, you, you, you look at a piece of property that's for sale and it has a price on it. And sure enough, you got to pay the price and buy the property. But once it becomes public land, it's priceless. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And one of the things that I think is so interesting about the three trails that make up this sort of network of trails on these three properties is like you were saying, I mean, they're right there, they're right next to each other and they're all so 
different from each other. You have Carter Nature Preserve, which takes you all along the rough sort of main coastline. And like this photo you can see here, and then you go across the street and you do Firth and you're in more of that wetland area and you're going across the streams and you're in, you know, in that area. And then you go over to Talalay and you're in this beautiful old growth forest. And it's just sort of like this, this great experience of getting all of these types of areas in, in ecosystems all in one. And it shows you how intertwined and connected everything really is in our area. And it's, it's something I think makes that really unique. And so then later down the road, oh, this is very timely. We, our next slide is we have the ribbon cutting at the new, the new access property. And there are friends, Max and Ruth, and of course, Earl Farley, who really helped George with this a lot and our intern. So I wanna kick it over to George because this is the most recent project that has happened here on this property. And it, I mean, you want to talk about putting trails where you didn't think you should put trails. <laughs> George, George had to do some really interesting work on this property, but it's given us access to a whole new part of it, uh, which is very cool. So George, please go ahead. And uh, Chrissy, could I just interrupt for a second? Uh, I may have to leave soon, but I just wanted to say, to follow up on what Margaret also said, that our son, Nasheen, grew up here and was inspired to become a writer, uh, a full-time writer, you could say, because of living here. And I mentioned that. We also have uh, Robin Firth, who is a, son, a daughter of John Firth, yes. who is, um, lives in England with her husband, Mark Rutter. And they come here every summer and they have a little place near us here. They love the uh, nature preserve. Uh, Mark walks it uh, almost every day when he's here, but he is uh, has written some poetry is published in England <laughs> about the nature preserve and mm. uh, without necessarily using the word nature, but he's always said he's referring to the Carter Nature Preserve and the environs around it. So there you have people who have been inspired uh, by the, as writers and poets, by the nature preserve. I just wanted to mention that before we shift to another topic. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Great. All right, George, well, tell us a little about this new trail. Uh, it, it is an appropriate picture. I do want to say, uh, you know, kudos to, to Norman and the whole Friends of Morgan Bay group for, you know, taking just all these projects on. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm really honored to, you know, walk in your guys' shoes of what you've done. And this new trail that we created uh, back in 2016 started off as a trail easement from George and Carol Sopkin uh, that connected the crossroads all the way down to uh, the eastern side of Carter Nature Preserve right at the head of the little uh, little inlet there. And I think Norman had actually laid out a good portion of that trail, especially going on the slope and crossing the little stream and into Carter Nature Preserve, my, my recollection serves me right. So we just came in a little bit and widened it, uh, put in a set of stairs and uh, used some intern labor, <laughs> used some intern labor uh, to help move some gravel and stones and, uh, and some bark mulch around and one of our interns, one of the first ones that we had uh, during my tenure was a young man, Tom Fast. And at the end, he said, my best and worst day were at Carter Nature Preserve, moving, <laughs> <laughs> moving bark mulch via wheelbarrow all day long. No. So, um, <laughs> so that was fun. Uh, you know, the picture that Chrissy had up there with Earl Farley and Matt and Max and Ruth, uh, they continued the 10 year rolling easement that George and Carol set up uh, to allow us access to the, through their land and off to Carter Nature Preserve. And Earl, both Earl Farley and Carrie Trask helped a lot in constructing the trail uh, during the time with the interns. And you know we were indebted to both of them for their insight and just the heavy equipment that they brought to the table uh, to make our backs a little bit, you know, E easier uh, lug and gravel by the sack load uh, down the slope. And uh, Earl created and designed a little bridge at the, at the head of the waters there that uh, is just incredible for the simplicity. Uh, and I've 
I vowed to make some more uh, in time at different parcels. Um, uh, so for the most part, that was that was it. You know, we uh, we took a summer to expand that trail, uh, cutting from uh, the 4.6 acres that Max and Ruth gave us, uh, that is now houses the parking lot to connect into. Uh, their property and the road system and then deviate from the road system uh, to the to the west to get to the nature preserve so it's uh it's 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 been a fun time um, I I disagree with Norman this is a great place all three properties you know just are awesome just the micro environments the habitat uh, I love going there and seeing it it's it, it's fresh and anew each and every time so. I agree. May I say something, Chrissy? Mm -hmm. It's Susan. Oh, thank you. First of all, George, I want to say, coming down those stairs mm -hmm. to the bridge that Earl made, mm -hmm. that is one of the most beautiful parts, I think, mm -hmm. because you're up and you're looking down at the big trees, but you're, no, you're looking down at them, not up at them. And that's unusual. Mm -hmm. And I just love that part and the other thing is I agree with you about the tower leg it 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 seems just woods but the thing is when you walk it over and over it becomes more and more beautiful there's a there's a um, what do you call a house foundation of some kind there are these beautiful old trees and it depends which way you go? I mean, it's so interesting. It's it's different if you go to the left than if you go to the right. <laughs> I love it. That's right, George. You know, we talk about these trails and we're showing these pictures of these trails, and uh, you and Norman are making it sound very easy breezy. But this is a, a ton of work that <laughs> that goes into these trails. And they're also quite costly. I mean, can you give a little bit of a sense of what, you know, what trail improvements like these might cost? Yeah. Look at this. It, it ranges quite a bit. Uh, we were able to get a, a, a grant from Fields Pond Foundation to help with the parking area. And that was probably on the order of $3,000 to clear trees and bring in gravel and create the parking area. And then, you know, a lot of the, for the trail that we worked on, the Sokin and Brennickmeyer trail, a lot of that was just donated material. You know, you can see some of the wood there for the bridges. Uh, that was actually, I think, scrap lumber that I uh, pilfered from a, a deck out at the Peterson property that we dismantled. <laughs> uh, so it was all in the family. And, uh, but yeah. a, a lot of the gravel and rocks were on Max and Ruth's property that uh, they had, you know, acquired over the years. And it was just, uh, you know, sh short of the, the bridge work, everything else was just hand tools and just, you know, not a lot of cost to that one. So that, this was a fairly, uh, cost-effective trail to put in. I would say maybe maybe 5,000 if you're not counting labor. Uh, others run up to, you know, 10, 15,000 dollars or more. Uh, what we just did for Parker Point South Street was quite a bit more. Yeah. So, um, but it's, it's, it's great. Uh, donations, grants, uh, you know, it, it, it all helps. That's right. And a lot of hours and labor. <laughs> I, labor. I wanted to mention, uh, Chrissy, that uh, when we were putting in the original planks in the and building the steps on the Carter Nature Preserve and the access to the Carter Nature Preserve, um, Andy Kandich uh, actually came and helped with me at the time and he, he donated all the cedar planks from his own property on Newbury Neck. Mm. He was retired from Jackson Lab and he donated not only cut it himself, he had it milled himself, and he brought it over, carried it in himself. And so we put in a lot of planks going at the access and also throughout the nature preserve and the wet spots. So I have to give Andy a credit for all the, all the work he did back at, at that time, back in, in the 1990s. That's great. 
Thank you for that. Deanna, I, you've been sitting so patiently. We have so many panelists on this call and we're definitely gonna run over an hour. So um, attendees should feel free to jump ship if you need to, this whole thing will be recorded. But Deanna, I'd love to bring you into the conversation because uh, if you'll pardon me, you're sort of you're sort of the young whippersnapper of this crew here, and you uh, you were my babysitter <laughs> when I was, I was growing up there. And, and I would love to just get your perspective on what it was like to be involved with all this and what these properties have meant to you growing up there, right. and living there. Right. Um, so. Uh, Thank you, everybody, for being here today. And um, I have, uh, you know, a, not a whole lot different to add to what everybody has said. Um, that whimsical side of um, that Margaret talked about for her boys was actually lived more by me. So I, you know, that that area is um, uh, essential to my self identity. I mean, I'm starting to first memories being down there um, and finding the tidal pools on the Carter Nature Preserve. And then as you get older, just following streams randomly and deer trails through the woods and um, and that transition that um, Susan talked about is very dear where, of course, I want others to be able to have that same kind of moment in nature where you get to confront yourself um in the in the, in a in a macrocosm way um that uh doesn't happen when you're with other people necessarily um and um but at the same time the the so somewhat of a feeling of loss that i'm not just going to get be able to go off trail anymore here right um we're deciding that this is where the trail is going and I'm going to follow the rules and stay on the trail. I don't get to explore these woods um, anymore. Um, so uh, yeah, those are, uh, I don't have a favorite spot. That was a question that you had put to me because um, it was more about the movement of, um, of these places than it was of uh, a single spot. So I'm, I was, I'm very honored to have been able to grow up there and it is the reason why I am still here. It's really home. That's great. Thank you well, so much. Uh, Chrissy, I want to say that we always need Deanna when she appears in the meeting. <laughs> we know that something's going to get done. She's great. <laughs> we need her brains and her energy. <laughs> it's so nice after you know i mean the initial sort of carter nature preserve happened in the mid 90s and you know here we are so many years later and you all are still neighbors you're still friends it's it's, it's really it's really wonderful um to think about that um I'll, I'll put this to Hugh or Susan Curran, and I know Hugh, you may need to jump off at some point here, but you got, you live on the side of the road, um, which goes towards Carter Nature Preserve, and you are, you know, you see people traveling and walking the road if they're like me, and they're starting in the new parking lot and walking in and doing the shore and then coming back up the road. You see people, can you share any sort of interactions you've had with hikers or people who are just discovering this place? People just are just so appreciative of it. And I think even before the pandemic, uh, once that the parking lot and the loop road, I mean, the Carter Nature Preserve was always um, a big draw, but since that, that whole loop has been put in, we rarely go by the parking lot when there aren't any, when, you know, when it's uh, empty of cars or trucks. And, uh, and since the, especially since the pandemic, people, it, it, it seems almost like a lifeline for them. They're, they're out there all the time. And we, we always hear just great appreciation. People love the trails um, and they're always very grateful for them. They, uh, I don't know, if you can add yeah, something. Well, I, I just wanted to add that uh, we go out pretty regularly, almost daily, um, if not every other day and 
I'm, there's hardly, I don't recall even through the winter time now, whether, or certainly through the fall, we would, that there were almost every day, there were at least, I would say at least two vehicles down by the bridge. So there's a little parking area there for three cars. And then in the, um, in the uh, fourth wildlife sanctuary across from there, that parking lot's got holds about four. There's actually been days when they had to park on the road because there was not enough room in there. And then I'd see, um, I'd sometimes, you know, say hello, how are you? Did you enjoy the walk? And they just, everybody glowed about that and ex ex expressed their appreciation as Susan said. But there was also uh, families that walked that road. And because we're right on the road, we see they make a circle. They either park down by the bridge and walk around as a kind of circle. Then they got to come back along the road in order to get to the car or it's the reverse. They park down at the uh, first wildlife sanctuary in that parking area. And there may be, they'll start there and go around and then they have to walk back along the road to get, get in there. And sometimes uh, there's whole families. That's what interested me. It wasn't just, uh, you know, seniors or in between. Now there's been, um, uh, you know, husband, wife, children, one, two, three, and all going together. And that, that's very, very uh, satisfying to see whole family groups doing that. I said, said, it's every day, every day. I don't think I've ever seen one day in the last few months when there wasn't at least one or two people in the process. And I'm not there all, out there all the time to judge, but just the times we would just go out periodically, someone was always there. So it's a great, great sense of being a truly community affair. And I'd sometimes ask people, where did you come from? And they'll say, oh, from down around Brooklyn or Brooksville or Ellsworth, Lemoyne, you know, all of that. Some even would say, well, I'm from Bangor. So you indicate just how far afield people were coming and they're not just you know within a few miles they're willing to travel 10 15 or 20 miles to get to be able to do yeah. this so uh thank you yeah. to rural heritage trust for making it well known throughout the communities well it's a it's a great place to get to recommend for folks for a couple of different reasons i mean one it's it's a great place to go have like i said these three really diverse experiences of sort of the main landscape between ta the woods of Talalay, along the streams in Firth, and then along the shore of Carter. And then, you know, it also provides a longer hiking opportunity mm -hmm. for people who are really looking to come and spend a chunk of time. They can easily do the whole trail system or they, you know, they can do both the Firth and Talalay in one go or do the whole thing and feel like they got a really, really good hike, which is something that's really important to some people, but there are options for younger families too, to do a shorter hike just alone. So that's been really great. Um, Margaret, I, you are an artist. You were my art teacher, in fact, for much of my elementary school yeah. time. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how these places maybe have inspired you as an artist. Well, yes. Um, because of where I am and located right there at the head of the bay, I see the bay every day, every morning every day and it's always changing. It is so, it is just incredible. Um, and I began to, it took me a while because initially we were building the house here and that took a lot of energy and concentration and time and keeping the fire going and applying band-aids to hurt fingers and egos. And truly to see what was in front of me took some peace of um, and leisure time. And, but then I started to um, paint um, every single morning. I would paint the bay. Hi, John. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't uh, find a picture of Eugene. I was so sad, but it's nice to see John. A wonderful picture of him. Mm -hmm. um, every morning, um, I would take my watercolors and paint what, uh, paint what I saw out of the uh, kitchen window. And because watercolors can be so fast, it was done quickly and then I could go about my business. You know? And it was, you know, now I do, I do it with acrylics and I do it with oil paints. I don't, I confess I don't go into the woods that much because this is an easy 
steady model, the bay, with its constant forms that change all the time with the light and the weather. You know, from one minute to the next, it can change and you have to be so fast to catch it. Um, this, I mean, the fascination with it and the beauty of it, after, after I retired from teaching, which was 24 seven occupation, um, and also retired from the library, which was stressful in another way because I had to learn technology and it was driving me nuts. <laughs> Um, I thought, okay, let me do something that pulls the art and the beauty, the location together and the neighborhood together. And that was, um, I created the little gallery in my field at the head of the bay. And that was meant for the artists and the craftspeople, the writers and poets who were creating to be able to exhibit their work, sell the work, and to then periodically every month, you know, have a get together of some kind with music and with food and with the artists relate to the, to the neighborhood and, you know, bringing it together in some way. And sadly this last year I wasn't able to do it because of COVID but I will do it again this summer, one way or another. Don't know how we're going to do it with distancing, but we'll do it. Um, but it somehow brings it together for me. And I can, I can do my paintings and I can get people to appreciate this beautiful place together. We had a, a, one event which I sent artists out to do a fresh paint of the bay. And they went all over the bay and came back in the afternoon and just exhibited and sold their work. And that, I really liked that and I think they did too. Um, so we'll do more of that, but it's an incredible place for me to be rooted as an artist. So that's wonderful. Go. Thank you. I could add, add something else about uh, people who have donated time. Well, we all know that Max Brennickmeyer and his wife, Ruth, um, donated uh, so much rights of way and so on. But when we were getting going uh, first few years, uh, I don't know, it was anyhow around 2000 maybe, Max would come down. Uh, he suffered a stroke, but still managed to come down to the shore. And I'd be working there on the nature preserve or doing something along there. I was obsessed with it, as you, as you know, for a while. And he would sit down on the rocks and just talk. And, uh, and it's just the sense of his showing, his showing his appreciation for the fact that it was being saved and the willingness to extend it to rights of way and doing all of that. And I think really that came from his just going down to the bay and feeling his, that connectedness to the bay and to the nature preserve that he felt he could help in extending its use in the way that he did wonderfully did both he and Ruth. So I'm very grateful to people like, like him who donated so much of their effort and energy and the funds to make it happen. Yeah, absolutely. It, it doesn't happen without people who give time, funds, land, all of it. It's yeah, it's such a team effort. We're so fortunate. Susan, Guilford, I should be more specific. We have three Susans on here. Susan Guilford, we just heard from Margaret talking about um, sort of studying the land from the aspect of, or from the perspective of being an artist. And you're really studying uh, the land out there from the perspective, a little bit of a scientist. And I wondered if you could talk a bit about some of the programs that are ongoing that people who are listening today can participate in if they'd like to, to go out and try this and contribute to some work. Thank you. I'm far from being a scientist, <laughs> um, but I, what I wanna talk about is community science, sometimes called citizen science, but perhaps nicer to call it community science because that really brings in everybody who's part of our community. Um, at the website, uh, Blue Hill Heritage Trust website for Carter Nature Preserve, you'll see some links there to, um, I think it's maybe five different 
opportunities, ways of engaging through community science with the Carter Nature Preserve. And I'll just tell you briefly what they are and then you can explore them if they're of interest to you. There are lots of ways to appreciate this property as you heard in this last hour. And this is just another way. So one of them, um, for people who like to bird, uh, eBird of course is the place to go. Um, and if you go to the eBird site, Carter Nature Preserve is a hot spot, and you can, for instance, for the month of February, check and see what birds you're likely to see when you're there. Um, and even if you wish, print a list and take it with you. Um, you can also add to the uh, eBird by posting your own list when you're there. Um, a similar program is iNaturalist, which is really for all plants and animals. And uh, as part of my main master naturalist capstone project, I did an inventory of plants and animals, which is ongoing. It's endless. <laughs> um, and there's a link to that. So if you're curious about whether a certain plant has been found at the Carter Nature Preserve, you could go there and have a look. Or if you just want to look around and see what people have noticed, Anyone can contribute to that. You just take a photograph of something you've seen there that you think is remarkable and you can post it to iNaturalist and it becomes part of this um, database that actually is used by scientists doing research and just interested people around the world. Um, <clears throat> another project is a phenology project uh, which started with Skudik Institute a number of years ago. And if you walk the trails, you'll notice there's some turquoise uh, tags that are on some of the shrubs. And it's part of a, a project uh, to monitor um, sort of the calendar of bloom time and when berries are produced and so forth along the trail. And it has to do with some research having to do with fall migrating birds. And is their food supply gonna be there when they arrive or has it already gone by? Um, and that's something you can look into more and actually participate in if you're interested. And then last uh, spring when COVID hit, there were so many families going out on the trail and uh, through uh, a friend's volunteer effort in creating some software, I was able to put together a scavenger hunt uh, for kids, but adults as well, uh, with 22 different photographs um, of different uh, plants, animals, rock forms at the Carter Nature Preserve. And a, and a hint about it, some, some science about that particular spot. And uh, you can follow that trail if you want. Um, and kids can see what they can find. And then the last one I wanted to talk about is the newest and the one I'm most excited about at this point. Um, back in, 2017, that was four years ago, uh, I was struck by all of the geological features that are along the coast, as everybody who's been there has noticed, and I became aware that our main geological survey had a place at their website where they had what they called field localities. They had special write-ups of interesting geological features around the state. And I just thought the Carter Nature Preserve might be a good one to add to that list. There are about 250 sites around the state and not a lot of them are around our area. So I wrote an email to the Geological Survey and I and just said you, someone there might want to come out to the Carter Nature Preserve and, and uh, offered to make muffins and provide coffee if somebody would come. <laughs> and I heard back to my amazement from our main state geologist, Bob Marvany, and he said he would be happy to come, which he did that summer um, on his own. And just finally this past summer, he finished his write-up and posted it at the website. And Chrissy's now put a link to it at the Carter Nature Preserve site. Um, he's done an amazing job. He's highlighted 18 different locations along that strip of coastline with a map and he has a photograph and a description of each of those spots. So you can actually, if you have it on your smartphone or if you wanna print it out, you can actually go along the shore starting at the head of the bay down to the cove 
and get a history of the geology of coastal Maine and have actual rocks that you have to find. That's the scavenger hunt part of this. Um, but he's given you a pretty good idea of where to look. Um, and it's really a marvelous addition. So there are some opportunities, but as everybody has said, you can go there and just enjoy it without doing anything further. But. That's right. And Paula, when, when these properties started getting conserved, you were a local teacher at Surrey School and you started you know, really engaging kids. And we've already seen some photos of Paula at the tide pools and things like that, uh, leading different, different programs. Can you talk a little bit about education and kids? Uh, sure, Chrissy. Oh, I think one of the most special things that we did together as a school, every year uh, the Surrey School was part of the uh, international coastal uh, cleanup in September. So we, we the whole school went in three different bu buses to different um, coastal sites around town. And the most, one of the most popular one definitely was going to the Carter Nature Preserve. And so it was a really good, uh, well, it was citizen science, really, the beginnings of that. And the, the kids, the older kids had a younger student that they partnered with and they, we, we completed the tally sheets and uh, so the younger children were, were wearing gloves and picking up and telling the older students what they had found and uh, and then we weighed what we had found and we contributed our data to the international um, record keeping of this coastal cleanup. We did that for a number of years um, the, as a school project and I was lucky to teach at the Surrey School at a time when field trips were really <laughs> Mm. Uh, very possible. And sure. I think most of the teachers at school really were involved in having the students feel a sense of place for Surrey. And I know I brought my class many times to the Carter Nature Preserve and we went, you know, we explored the woods, we explored the tidal pools, we had a ranger from Acadia come and talk about the wonderful geology there. And, the, and at the Firth, we were very lucky because Norman put in the trail there and beavers kind of cooperated by putting in a dam and a lodge right alongside the trail. So that was, that was a great learning yep. experience. Here's a photo right here. <laughs> oh, okay, all right, perfect. It, it, it's kind of remarkable though. We, we put the trail in across the stream and almost a year later, the beavers moved in. It's like they moved into our neighborhood. We didn't go to theirs. They, they've sim yeah. since left the yeah. area. I think they ate Dry all the trees things. that were appealing to them and uh, they've moved on, but uh, they're definitely still in Surrey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Haven't seen many at the Firth along the streams there. But I, I think one of my last projects before I retired was great and Hannah Weber helped me with this. We had, I was teaching first grade that year and we had the kids, we invited senior citizens from Surrey to come along the access trail to the Firth of Talley with our students as their guides. And it was each student found something along the trail that they wanted to teach their se the senior partners about. And th that, was a, that, was, that was really wonderful because it was cross-generational sharing. Uh, yeah, that, that was kind of one of my last experiences with kids from the school on the trails. That's and, great. Yeah. And a lot of the kids talked about after having visited the trails, they brought their parents who didn't know about them. Mm -hmm. So that right. was that was wonderful too. Mm. I'm just uh, pasting a link to the Carter Nature Preserve site. Um, because somebody was asking about links to those wonderful resources that Susan was sharing. So there are, so there you can go to that page right there and um, scroll down beneath the maps and you'll see links for the geology survey and all the great uh, scavenger hunts and citizen mm -hmm. science things going on there. Susan Chatterley, can you talk a little bit about 
just some of the wildlife, you know, between Firth and Talalay properties up near that wetland and then coming down towards the bay. That's a major wildlife corridor in all of those three properties, which is really important. Um, can you talk a little bit about wildlife and sort of changes in the forest and on those lands? Well, I'll try. And um, I have written myself some notes, but now that you said, you know, I've thought of more too. So, but let me start by saying, it's interesting how a place changes. And because as you see, everybody here except Diana has pretty um, gray hair. We've been here a long time and we've seen changes. And one thing for the people who love birds is we still have the birds we first had in the woods in the Carter Nature Preserve. We have in the summer, the oven birds come back, you know, we, well, I'm not sure we have that many spotted sandpipers and they don't nest here anymore. But because the land is changing and a lot of the softwoods are falling down and the hardwoods are growing up, we now have black-throated blue warblers because they like a mixed forest. And before we had black-throated green warblers because they like a softwood forest. So if you go out and you listen to the birds, you know, after you go on the Cornell site and all, you could almost picture what that forest might be. It's sort of interesting. And the other thing that's changed, and I'm still on the Carter Nature Preserve, there are things in the tally too, but um, is we went through a period of not having the black ducks come in the evening when the tide was low to eat the mud snails off the mud. And I think that was because there was still some septic run coming down from the stream and there was some pollution and or something affected the mud snails. Well, whatever that was, it cleaned itself up. We've got the mud snails back and we have that beautiful scene. There are buffalo, you know, a hundred black ducks in the gloaming, going, walking on the mud, um, eating, the, eating the mud snails. Um, but the green crabs have really helped get rid of and change, unfortunately, the horseshoe crab nesting that we had there because the green crabs eat the horseshoe crab eggs. And the green crabs also nest in the Spartina mud in the winter, the young ones do. And so you can see, I was looking at those pictures and some of them are long enough ago that the Spartina mud, you know, that thatch of mud and roots went all the way down uh, to the, almost to the mid shore line in some of those old pictures. And it's way up now, it's disappearing. Part of it is because of climate change and the little increase in, in water level and the increase in storm. But some of it is green crap. And so you have to learn, and it's hard to learn this, is that places change, you know? Mm -hmm. They're not always, you can't keep it static, but you can preserve it so it can change you know, and something new will come. Mm -hmm. We have a ton of woodpeckers now in the, in the Carter Nature Preserve because so many of the old trees have uh, died and they're full of wood beetle larvae. So that's one thing. Um, but the thing is, I haven't said anything about yet about the, the Firth and the Talalay land, that they're full of everything. And because I border them, um, I know a goshawk <laughs> hangs out in there. They nest in there because one just took one of a crow in my front yard uh, two days ago, a couple of days ago. Wow. And, and that was a pretty violent confrontation. And so back there in the Talalay and the Firth land, it's like a nest of really wild creatures. Bears, you know, a whole bunch of deer, bucks and does. I've got a bobcat, it comes from there, you know. I just happened to be a writer 
who, when I can't figure out what to write, I stand by the window and I see <laughs> all these things, but I know where they come from. You know, they come from, so the land that we save can also be a preserve for these wilder creatures, which we rarely see. Oh, excuse me, I, I have to click off now. I have another class that I have to teach. So I wanted to also say that without uh, the Surrey wetland that Susan organized, uh, a lot of this may ne never have come to be because it was through that inspiration of her efforts that uh, inspired so many other things to take place over the years. So I wanted to. Well, let that. me just say about you. That <laughs> If you hadn't gone around from house to house, when I remember saying to you, don't bother, it'll never happen. I never should have said that. You made it happen. And we owe you everything for that. Thank you very much. We'll see you then. Thank you for putting thank this you. on. Thank you. It's been yeah. wonderful. wonderful. Thank, thank you for seeing. Thank, thank you, everybody. everybody. Thanks, everybody. So I'd like to ask Diana another question. Um, you know, Susan is just talking about wildlife and the things that she has seen, and you've spent so much time in those woods, and even before they were officially conserved and with trails, really exploring those woods. Um, what have, what sort of wildlife sightings have you seen? I don't think Deanna's with us anymore. I think we lost her. Shucks. Okay. Well, I'll pass it on to anybody else. It's Susan Guilford or Paula and Norman. Any exciting wildlife sightings? Wow. <laughs> um, tracks. <laughs> We've yeah. seen bobcat tracks, moose. moose um, tracks, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. there, was, there was a moose that would, ha that would come up the stream here and mm -hmm. come right behind our house. I don't know where it was going, but you see the tracks come out and then go back. As years ago. Uh, may I interrupt and say one thing, Chrissy, is that Susan, Paula, and yeah. I went down to the preserve and we were walking, you know, we think we know it. The thing is, you never know it. There's so much there. And we found these little things sticking up in the mud. <laughs> I mean, and we didn't know if they were animal or vegetable. <laughs> but the thing is, there were thousands of them. And we'd never seen them before. Huh. So I wrote Brian Beale and he <laughs> said, uh, Susan, what did he call them? Something mud. Uh, tape, yeah, tape mud. Tape mud. Tape mud, yeah. And that's the name of an animal. Let me tell you about it. It's an amphipod. <laughs> it builds a little tower about this big out of mud and tiny little pieces of shell and stone, and then it lies at the top of it and it waves its feelers and <laughs> gathers food into its mouth. And it's and that's just what it looks stick. like too, it's amazing. Yeah, and, <laughs> and we have lived here all this time, we've never even noticed it. Isn't that exciting? That is exciting. <laughs> That's great. We thought we had discovered a new uh, yeah. <laughs> species, but apparently it's pretty common. But <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. And I, I one day when I first started working at the trust, went to go get some photos of Carter Nature Preserve, and I parked right near Margaret's house, uh, right there where the bay comes in on the bridge. Mm -hmm. And some of the photos that I got that day were on the slideshow earlier. It was unbelievable. There were like six seals, eight osprey, three mm -hmm. eagles, huge swarming <laughs> schools of fish, all at one go. It was just, it was such an incredible sight to see. And then in hiking in Talalay and Firth, you talk about the woodpeckers, not some of the biggest pileated woodpeckers in those forests. It's just, it's so fun. There's always something to hear and to see. And it's just, I don't know, it's amazing. George, you, you know, when we, we talk about these trails and these properties, there's ongoing maintenance. There are potential stewardship issues that might arise with these types of properties. Are there any, you know, things that you see needing attention or that we need to keep an eye on with these properties moving on in the future? 
Mm. Um, I think the trail stewards for the most part had things under control. Um, both Sandy and I and the interns this summer had like uh, probably three uh, stair projects to do at Carter Nature Preserve, mm -hmm. uh, rebuilding the main staircase mm -hmm. from the, the Firth Field yeah. uh, easement <laughs> access down to the shore, yeah. uh, and then to try and mitigate some of the soil erosion, both at the, the far point, uh, we want to put a set of stairs in mm -hmm. to, the, to the ledge and the shore, mm -hmm. and then also in between those two points where you enter from the shore to get into the woods, uh, there's there's need for a couple sets of stairs there. And there'll probably be stone steps, uh, all, all three of those. Nice. And uh, a new handrail for the, the, the major stone staircase coming down from the, yeah. the Firth Field. And then uh, upgrading bridges. Uh, we had just recently, Sandy and I were out um, at Tallaway and uh, yeah. installed two new uh, sills for um, bridges and decked, decked them. We need to come back and put some handrails on them. But uh, you know, there's always little things that need to get done and and upgrades and like, oh, well, you know, we've this is seen, you know, the end of its day, so it's time to to fix. And and now that I see this photo here, I need to go out and work on some bog bridging too. <laughs> so uh, there's there's always something to do at all our properties. So, and, uh, you know, we're very appreciative of all our stewards and people calling in and emailing us and let us know if there's an issue here or there. Um, we'll just, you know, uh, we'll get to them. <laughs> Be confident we'll get to them. So. That's right. That's great. Well, I, I've, Folks, if you guys have anything else that you want to say or add that you think hasn't been touched on, we've gone an hour and 40 minutes and we have a remarkable number of people who are still with us listening in, which is just great. Um, anything else you folks who are still on the line want to share? Well, thank you, Blue Hill Heritage Trust. None of this would have been done without you. Really? So uh, we just love you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Lisa Welches, or not Lisa, but somebody right before asked if the trails are open in the winter. Yes. Yes. All of our trails are open in the winter. Um, we try to have a number of parking areas plowed out and, and the Carter Nature Preserve Firth Tallaght parking area is one of them. It's all done by volunteers, so we can't always guarantee it, but you are always very welcome to hike the trails and I recommend it. I mean, there it's a whole new world out there in the winter time. So yeah. that's a really fun place to go and check out. Um, we've sort of answered questions along the way. So I just want to say how grateful we are to the Friends of Morgan Bay, to the Firth and the Talalay families for, and all of the people along the way who worked with them, who helped preserve these three really magnificent places uh, for our community. I want to thank everybody who donates to this work. Um, our work doesn't happen without a huge team effort, and that includes our donors, it includes our volunteers, um, and we are so grateful for this community for helping make it work. If you feel so inclined to help support this work, our trails are programming, I invite you to visit our website and make a donation. It helps uh, continue to keep these places in, in good shape and protect more places. So thank you very much. To everybody who joined us, thank you for our panelists. Um, yeah. Thank you, Chrissy. You, you did such a phenomenal job to put this together. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. It's very self-serving. I learned so much on these. I just, <laughs> I love it. It's great. So we'll go ahead and close out now. Thank you everybody for joining thank us. You. And we will not be doing a live one of these in March. We will be releasing a pre-recorded one on Long Island uh, with Denny Robertson, which is a oh. fascinating presentation. Wow. Uh, and so that will be released on our website and on our YouTube page in March. And then in April, we will have another live story of place about Petersbrook and Penny's Preserve, which is another just mm -hmm. unbelievable property in Blue Hill with uh, some of the folks who donated that land, our trail stewards, mm -hmm. um, other people. So I hope you'll join us then. Thank you very much, everybody, so much, and have a terrific evening.
Thank you. You too. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. 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 Good night.